Otello is a story that everybody knows. They have studied it at school, they have read it at some time or another. And it's a very simple, direct, and remarkably clear story in the opera as put together by Boito and Verdi. It's all about an evil lieutenant of Otello, Iago, who really poisons the mind of Otello against his own wife, Desdemona. And it's all out of jealousy. He, in fact, is the one who's jealous. He's jealous of Cassio, having received promotion, but he's always warning Otello not to be jealous. And in those moments when he does it, we hear very sinister music underneath. Well, Otello falls for the story. He gets duped, he gets tricked. He's made very jealous of his own wife, and he murders her, and only finds out at the very end that in fact Iago was behind the whole thing. He was pulling the strings. And knowing that he has no future, that he has killed the only love he ever really had, Otello suicides at the end. So it's a great tragedy. And it's a tragedy about the frailty of human beings, the fact that we do listen to gossip. We often believe it to our own detriment, as Otello discovered. Otello is such a powerful work that you shouldn't do it unless you have a first-rate Otello. And that was the first element that I needed to have in considering doing the opera at all. And when I heard Sergei Larin, I knew that he would be appropriate for it by 2003. We actually discussed it in 1999 over dinner in Paris. And he agreed that he would take on the role for the first time here in San Diego. And then we built the cast around him with Marina Mascheriakova Alexandru Agake, Richard Troxell, Priti Gandhi, and we've developed, I think, a wonderful ensemble for this production that allows him to excel in the role of Otello. <laughs> I think that for every uh, tenor who can uh, um, maybe in the whole career afford uh, this role, every tenor is a um, lucky person. It's difficult, but it's so exciting, so interesting, you know. When you start from, your, uh, from the very top uh, esultate, so you really, you live in uh, this drama. And this is why I, I like so much Otello. I can, I can uh, tell it now because before it was, uh, I was always thinking, mm, yes, I like uh, the character, mm, but maybe it's not completely, you know, my cup of tea. But now I tell that I love this character. And uh, you, you cannot tell that Otello is completely positive or it's, it's a hero. Maybe, uh, especially uh, um, during the, Mm, during the uh, development of uh, the story, maybe he is more negative than positive. But the end, the, the, the end of the opera, when he kills this demon, and uh, comes this, this, this moment, you know, of catharsis, when his soul is completely uh, cleaned by, yeah, he killed his wife but he cleaned his soul because he understood what he did. I'm so attracted by, mm, by musical drama, by, 
by this masterpiece of Verdi. And uh, I will try to, uh, to do this, at least in one production. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I, 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 I cannot think about, about the future, but I uh, should and I must do honestly my duty now here, San Diego. Marina I adore. I think she's a, a fun lady, a wonderful singer. I'd seen her work in Europe and we had a wonderful long dinner once in Italy after a performance that went on for hours. And she's such a sensitive, enjoyable, happy woman. And I knew that she would fit the nature of our company. With all our information, with all you know, years which is were prepared before, the most difficult to be still, uh, you know, to be still innocent, to be still uh, really clear with your old decisions. It's uh, it's big challenge for that role, and you have to feel it all the time. What you are doing this piece, from beginning to the end. Maybe it's, an, it's not really the right word for, the, for English. It's very, uh, the, you know, the, the role is very clean. You don't need to be dramatic on it. You don't need to be showing everyone in the public that, you know, look at I'm dying, it's just so beautiful, I'm dying in a few minutes. No, it's just, you know, normal, uh, like she did before many, many times. And it's just take a little bit much more emotionally when she starts to speak about herself. And the most beautiful, per noi, per noi, tu prega. This is the most beautiful, you know, you have, you know, always you praying for us. And uh, that's, that's the beauty of this, uh, of this scene. And uh, again, very, very clean. And this is, I think, the most dramatic. You don't need to, you know, show in everyone. It's too, too complicated, too, too non-natural, let's say. You know, before, before people, of course, she felt something that, you know, something fatal things has happened with her. But, you know, you, you don't need to show in this. I, I, it's my feeling. You must be the most innocent on it. Alexandru Agake first was uh, heard by me on recording and then I saw him at Covent Garden as a wonderful Simon Bocanegra quite a few years ago with Kiri Takanoa. And I knew that he had the strength of character as a, an artist, as a singer and a performer to stand up to Sergei and Marina. The character of Iago uh, it's a complex one. So it's a very he. It's a very has very more faces, and these faces I think uh, it's uh, in um, uh, he change all the time the relation in in uh, in order to uh, whom he's speaking with. 
So he has, um, for instance, with Rodrigo, he is very ironic. With Cassio, he's very free and easy. With um, Othello, Othello is very respectful and very admirative. He shows, uh, of course, he's not. And uh, <coughs> but he's, he's uh, an evil. He's a villain uh, person, a villain man. He's not a Satan. He's not a Mephisto. He's just an ordinary man who hate uh, everything. Uh, uh, what he hasn't, he has not. So he cannot love. So he hates the people who uh, are in love, to, or who showed the love to, uh, and respect for, for the other people. Uh, he's not a courage, he, courage man. He's a soldier, but he's a coward. Uh, he's a violent, a perfid. Uh, so what? Uh, what? Uh, it's worst. It's uh, Iago. He has no uh, principle of morality and uh, religious, uh, uh, how do you say, when some believe in, in the God and everything. That's why, uh, from instance, in, in the credo, when he sings uh, credo, he tells that uh, everything, uh, he believes in the evil God, in, the, in an evil man, in an evil nature, and uh, He's a very terrible character, I think. When it comes to the great Verdi works in this company, I always think of Eduardo because Eduardo has a long association with us. He cares about the company's standards, he cares about where we're going, and he brings such a wealth of experience and knowledge, and particularly when we have a singer doing a role for the first time. <laughs> Una vela, una vela. Un vecino, un vecino. Por la fogura sveva. Una spilla, una spilla. Ha donato il canon. Il nome di luce. It's very important to know that uh, this is uh, uh, the, the mature Verdi, the completely mature Verdi. Verdi had three periods in his life uh, as, a, as an artist. The first period was uh, beautiful uh, uh, tunes, uh, beautiful uh, singing, uh, great aggressive uh, theater. The second period was uh, more mature, and he entered uh, in the human soul of the characters he was uh, depicting. In the third part, uh, he mm, not just was able to enter in the human souls, but he, he was able to use completely new uh, means uh, for describing this. And I think this comes from uh, what uh, he used to call the parola scenica, which means uh, the scenic word. He starts uh, with this cooperation uh, with uh, Boito, and he starts uh, from the meaning of the word, and uh, then uh, he translates these uh, words uh, in music, not just uh, in the vocal lines, uh, but in music in the orchestra. What is interesting, and I'm asking the public uh, to, to pay attention to this, uh, is the kind of color the orchestra will have, uh, the kind of uh, instruments that he will use uh, for uh, describing uh, situations, to, to perceive the color of the English horn when uh, in the last act uh, uh, Desdemona is uh, the singing that song of, uh, of uh, her mother a long time ago. To, uh, to pay attention to the color of the bases uh, when Otello enters uh, and he, uh, is going to kill uh, Desdemona. Deep, 
dark. Only that instrument could uh, describe uh, the, 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 the situation. I need exactly in tempo for the violas. And also uh, the way that he, he suggests uh, the musical line in one way and then it doesn't go in the obvious ways as uh, one could uh, expect. But it goes somewhere else according to the meanings of the words. So in this sense uh, he is very modern. I would like uh, to do from uh, letter uh, double N. Letter double N, which means uh, Valporto. No. Valporto con quanto più posta. This has to be piano. Okay? <laughs> opinion there must be a, a, a part of uh, uh, improvisation in rehearsals. I try not to come uh, to well prepared uh, with an idea and uh, the result uh, that the work will be done uh, with the, the, the kind of singers that I will have, the kind of orchestra and uh, of course uh, according to what the stage director uh, thinks and sometimes uh, I can have also some different opinion and sometimes uh, I have uh, some argument <laughs> with, uh, but this is uh, life, this is part of, uh, of, uh, of art. Now, move. You've got to senti, se pria di te morir. Your eyes have to re register. Morir dovessi mi sepelici. Those two words really have got to register with you. Morir. This is a special uh, human uh, but also professional relation with, uh, uh, with Sonia because uh, we know, let's say, 40 years probably something <laughs> like that. Before, we both uh, came to La Scala working as assistant. I was assistant of many conductors, so she was assistant yeah. of many directors. Alice, don't fuss with this. It's very important. All right. uh, you know, however, however it's... Just grab it. And you go. know, where she's going. If you... Emilia, te ne prego. If, when you take the... When she calls you the Emilia, counter clear, rather than going to her, so that you're closer to this. Okay. Distendi sul mio letto la mia... E prendi l'altro, prendi un altro, ce lo colevo sbagliato. I'm not one of these directors that tips the interpretation one way or the other or tries to be very intellectual. I just listen to the music and try and flow with the music and express that on the stage. Sorry, I'm pig-headed. Well, think of, think of that and see what comes out of it when you don't do it. Yeah, that is... Yeah. And start the tension earlier. On amore, dei folle gianti amore. What the hell are you talking about? Mona Bianca. Ah! Even that. You know, just one hand as you turn to go away from him. I have to show singers what I want because I don't know what I want until I do it myself. I know the score very hard, very well, I know, but the encounter with every singer is different. So you can't come in with a fixed set of ideas or something written down in paper because it's a building process which happens in the encounter of your two personalities. I used to, I have to stand up and show what I want, but I used to think, oh, you ought to be able to sit there and explain it intellectually. 
And I always felt, well, there was something missing in my way of directing until I read Taran Guthrie's memoirs. And Taran Guthrie says, um, I don't know why, but the how is inextricably linked with the why. So then I thought, okay, if Taran Guthrie does that, then it's okay. Um, question of how you direct. Everybody directs in a different way. Some people direct. Peter Hall once said, it doesn't matter what you do, it matters why you do it, it matters what you're thinking. First of all, you have to get the thinking process right, and then you do it. So it doesn't matter if you go left or you go right, but it matters why you go left or you go right. When I was doing the Don Carlos in Los Angeles, there was a singer who was singing to Balda who wanted to be a director, and we went out one day, she took me on a hike in the mountains, and she said, to, it's, I'm very lucky to work in Los Angeles because Peter Hemmings has so many great directors coming in, and I learned from watching everybody's style. And so there's people that direct by being totally brilliant, and we're all fascinated by the fact that they never stop talking. There's people that direct by terror, you know, everybody's shaking and their knees are trembling. There's people direct by secrecy and taking people off into the corner and whispering and nobody else ever knows. She said, it's strange because you don't do any of these things. You just direct on a flow of energy and you, everything you say is open for everybody else and you just take us along with you on the flow of your energy. Well, I'd never stopped to think or formulate how or why I directed until she said this. I have to tell you, as I've got older, when the flow of energy hasn't maybe been as, as uh, enthusiastic as it used to be, it's a bit more wearing on me. But it's true. I mean, it just, the music somehow makes something happen, and I have to get up and move it on. I can't sit still. I can't actually sit in rehearsals. I have to stand all through rehearsals because I want to feel the life of the thing. There are some operas in which the chorus becomes a real protagonist and is very dominant. A good example is Puccini's Turandot, where the whole of the opening is devoted to the chorus, and much the same happens in Verdi's Otello. Without a great chorus to launch the opera, as it were, during the storm, the opera will fall flat, and fortunately, we have a great chorus here in San Diego led by Todd Simmons. I believe that Otello is probably, next to the Requiem, one of the most difficult choruses for them to learn. At the same time, it was one of the easiest ones in that they enjoyed it so much. Uh, with Norma, it was difficult to learn because there was not a lot musically challenging about it. In a piece like this, because it's so musically challenging, they have to concentrate more, they have to focus more, they have to work harder to learn it. And so they learn it more s solidly and quicker. And you begin by te breaking them up, teaching them individually who sings what, how they interact with each other, because you can't learn your individual line. You'll hear throughout, particularly during the Fogo de Joyo, they have individual lines, but they form one solid line. And they have to learn individually where they are and how they work with the entire st structure. So they have to be singing everybody's line in their head, or they'll be late. <laughs> opera, the chorus is a very important character in that they are the ones who are seeing the battle at sea. You know, has our boat sunk, or we see a flag, or we see a sail, uh, it's the lion, it's our guys, oh, oh, now then they sink, and then, oh, he's okay, but oh, no, now Otello's ship is sinking, oh, he's okay. And they're the ones that through their actions and their texts are the ones that paint the picture to the audience 
of something that is nowhere being seen whatsoever. But because they're there, they give the audience this big image that's off stage. The chorus has to act not just physically, but with their voices. And we do that from the beginning. You know, their opening, una vela, you know, they have to say that with fear in them. They have to just sing that. And it's almost spoken. They have to give you, if you're only hearing them, the picture of how they are feeling. Eduardo, likewise, wants that exact same thing. If that's there, not there, no matter how much direction that Sonia gives you, it's not going to make sense just because they're standing in a position or doing something. They have to be able to act with their voices and their minds and their bodies. <laughs> We have the chorus, we have the artists, we have the conductor, we have the director, and this is an opera not to be missed. Thank <laughs> you. 